Hey everyone, welcome back to mini lecture number 12. Uh, this is for Computer Science 163 at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Uh, this is Jess Riesma, and we will be talking today about reading and writing files, so file I.O. input output. This is uh, chapter 8, sections 1 through 3 in your textbook, and I really encourage you to check out this tutorial link. Um, just open it up, you know, see what you like. Um, there's a bunch of information, but it's all very, very well organized, um, very accessible. Um, it's I would say even better than a textbook, so check it out. Um, and of course, if you want to look at the reference to figure out how to use every single function, and um, then you can go to this reference uh, web page as well. You'll remember from before, we talked about input streams and output streams. Um, I really, of all of the self-check questions, I encourage you to pause for this one um, to really think about it, because this will be very important for uh, today's lecture. So think here, see if you can create a diagram of what uh, a stream would look like. What's at the end? of the stream. Uh, why do we think of it like a stream? What's flowing? Um, what is it flowing to or away from? And so on. But do it now because we're going to get to the picture in just a sec. So three, two, one. Let's do some quick review of streams. So here we have the blue um, thing in the center as being your executing program and data flows via the input stream from the keyboard um, to your program. That's, you know, via CN. Now, as we'll learn later today, it can also uh, flow from a file via, an out via another kind of input stream, a file input stream. The executing program can also simultaneously or at a different time be writing to say C out via an output stream. So C out is an example of an output stream. You could also have an output file stream and we'll talk about that more later. But the basic idea is there you're having data flowing from the program through the stream into the screen or a file. There are two main types of files, um, and to this day, like you know, having worked with all kinds of different file formats and stuff, all of them can pretty much be grouped into one of these two categories. There's text files and there's binary files. Text files are basically files that contain um, letters, like for instance, ASCII or Unicode. Um, even a web page is just really text files or uh, text um, characters and stuff uh, under the hood. So it's something that you can open up a simple text editor like WordPad, Notepad, Text Edit. Gedit, uh, Vim, Emacs, etc., and you can open them, um, and it's it's nice and easy. Binary files, on the other hand, um, they're ones that if you try to open them with a text editor, either the text editor will complain and say, "I can't open this because I don't know how," or it will just it'll try to open it and it will just look like garbage to you. So let's look at the two advantages. Why would we want to write in one over the other? The advantage to a text file is that well, hey, we can read it. And granted, it may not be in our language, and we may not know what it's necessarily saying. Like, I can read, you know, a super dense philosophical textbook, and I might not have that great of an idea of what's going on. Or, you know, a super dense biology textbook. But I can at least read words. And that's an advantage. Another advantage is that when you're outputting to a text file, you can use streams, uh, output streams and input streams, to output to these files. And it turns out you do that in, uh, also for binary files, but it's a little bit more tricky. Um, it's easier to do when you're writing to text files. And the formatting is the same as when you would do it for C out or C in. A disadvantage of a text file is that it's slower to write. So it takes longer to, to translate from the computer's binary language under, you know, in the hood, under the hood to um, something that looks nice and is formatted nicely for us. It also takes up a lot of space. So for example, the complete works of William Shakespeare, if you download that from Project Gutenberg right now, it's about 5.5 megabytes uh, of all of his, his you know, life writings, which is cool. We'll compare that to binary files in just a sec, but let's just see, put that out there for now. But it does take up more space. So a lot of times what people will do is they'll sacrifice precision to save space. So for instance, some of the scientists uh, collaborators that I work with, when they send me data, um, they could send it to me in, term, in binary, which will take less space, or they could send it to me as a text file. What they typically do when you're sharing data with another uh, colleague is you send them the text file. Even though it's, it's a bigger file, you know that the other person is going to be able to read it. And if you need to, you can put like a comment in there or something too. So they'll send me the text file because they know I can read it. But sometimes they're really big. So what they'll do is instead of you know giving me you know a, a data file with like 16 digits for every value, they'll maybe give me just two or three values or two, two or three digits. And so that can cut this, um, the size of the file by a third. 
binary files, let's look at them. Uh, one of the advantages is that it's the computer's native language, so it doesn't need any translation. So it's super fast to read and write. It just basically transports the data straight from the memory uh, to the file if you're writing, or straight from the file to memory if you're reading. So very fast. It's also very space efficient. So let's go back to the complete works of William Shakespeare. Um, it was 5.5 megabytes. Now if you can encode it using CMIX, um, which is a new compression algorithm for a text, uh, you can encode it to just 1.0 megabytes, um, which is pretty good. And that's not even as good as text compression algorithms can get. You can get much, much better than that. And also with binary, there's no loss of precision. So whereas it takes um, something, you know, if each character is a byte, and it takes me 16 or 17 um, bytes to store one double precision number, I can do the same um, value in just eight bytes um, for uh, if, I'm, if I'm doing binary. And depending on how you format things, it can be even less. So one of the disadvantages of this is that it's not human readable, so you don't know if the numbers you're reading in are necessarily the right ones. Um, you have to trust that you know the file format. And that's really it. <laughs> Binary files are fantastic. I encourage you to use them, um, though maybe not for a little bit longer um, until you have a need to. Um, when you're just learning this, definitely encourage you to use text files. If you want more information, there's a great tutorial here. Here's an example text file. Now, in order to understand how a computer writes a text file, we need to understand a little bit about how they're encoded. So in this one, uh, you can count the characters and there's more characters than what you see, right? So I want you to think about how many there are. And then I'll go on, we can take a look. So first of all, I'm sure you've guessed that there are spaces. <clears throat> so here are all the spaces in this text file represented by these little blue boxes. All right, there's also tabs. Now tabs are usually represented, um, they're just, in the computer, they're represented by a single character, backslash T. Now, when they're actually presented on a screen, most programs will render them as somewhere between three and six tabs, sometimes as many as eight or 10, though that's rare, but usually about four or five tabs, or four or five spaces per tab. There's no standard. Another character that you may, may have thought of, or maybe not, is the line feed. This is also called the new line character. These are printed at the end of every single line and are represented by a little backslash n. So yeah, backslash n. You'll see that in some later slides. So on every single end of these lines, you'll have one of these, except the very end. And there's not one at the very end because there's no, extra, there's no line feed. So the, the line feed is basically saying, um, you could think of it as being like, this is the end of a line, but a better way to think of it is saying, start a new line. So there's not one at the very end because you're not saying start a new line. Instead, we have something called the end of file marker. Now I have this not as a, a filled in box, but rather as a dotted red line. So there is a, a special um, marker in com the computer's memory that says this is the end of a file, but it's not part of the file in the same way. It's not a character that you can just write to the file. That's something that every single file that you'll ever see has exactly one end of file character marker. Because if you had one halfway through, of course, then your file would be shorter and the rest of it would just be garbage. So there's only one end of file marker per file. So if you do the math, this ends up being that many characters for each of the lines. Now, um, so 69 characters total. One other thing that um, you might see, and this is something that is, um, if you take the same file and you type it up in Windows instead, you'll actually see that there are more characters. And that's because if you, uh, what Windows does is, uh, it goes back to the day when there were typewriters. And so in addition to having a new line, which is the green uh, things, it would also have a carriage return. And so the carriage return, the line feed in Windows parlance means go to the next line, but stay at the same column. It's as if you were using your typewriter and you rolled the paper up a line, but your typewriter stayed in the same position, you know, on the far right side of the, of the line. So a carriage return says, okay, now make your, your, you know, the next character you type go to the beginning of the line. So there, Linux and Mac and everything put those two things in the same thing, the same character. 
So they treat the new line as go to the next line and start at the beginning of the line, whereas Windows splits them up into go to the next line via the line feed, but also go to the beginning of the line via the carriage return. So Windows has an extra character. Um, and if you ever try to open up a file in Windows uh, that was created on Mac or Linux, it might look a little funny. And if you ever create, try to open up a text file that was created on, in Windows on Mac or Linux, it'll look funnier. Um, but yeah, that's how it goes. How do we do basic text file input and output? The first thing to do when you're writing a C++ program is to pound include fstream. Now fstream stands for file stream. And that's kind of like how we have IO stream being input output stream. So fstream will uh, have data types such as if stream standing for input file stream, of stream standing for output file stream, and a few other functions and other variable types as well. Now, the first thing to do uh, after that in your actual program is to declare a file stream variable to represent the file that you want to use, or rather not just the file, but the stream. Once you've done that, you can open the file. Um, and we'll show you how to do that, or I'll show you how to do that in just a little bit. But when you open the file, it will link it to the stream uh, variable so you can use it. You can access the actual physical file on your computer through your stream variable. Once it's open, you can then use the input stream to read from the file, or you can use your output file stream to write to the file, depending on what kind of file stream you are using. Finally, you want to close the file when you're done with it. If you close a file that you're reading from, that means that maybe another process could read from it as well or something. Um, an output file stream, if you close the file, then that will end that, or that'll put that end of file marker at the end of that file to say, hey, we're done with it. It's like sealing an envelope. So what does opening a file really do? First, it associates the C++ identifier for your file with a physical disk name for the file. So it's basically creating a link between your variable and then the name of that file, the physical file itself, on the disk. Now, if it's an input file and that file doesn't exist, that means you're trying to read from a file that doesn't exist, then that opens not successful because you can't read from something that's not there. If you're trying to write to a file and that file doesn't exist, then a new file with that name is created. Nice, handy. Now, here's the kicker. If the output file already exists and you try to write to that file, it gets erased. Now, there are ways to do it so it's not erased. You can add to the end of that file if you want. And that's something that you want to be careful of and, and you can do using the append um, mode. We'll talk about modes later. Finally, what it will do in either case, whether you're writing or uh, reading from the file, is it places a file reading marker at the very beginning of the file pointing to the first character in it. It's, you can kind of think of it like if you open up the book to read or to write on, and you put your finger where you're reading or writing from. So if you're following along in the text with your finger, that's basically what this reading file marker is. It's keeping your place. Where in the file are you reading from? Or if you're writing to the file, where are you writing to? We're going to go now through an example for how to open a file for writing and how do we write to that file. The first thing to do is to pound include fstream. Fstream is the header file that defines a lot of things like the IO stream or the sorry the F the IF stream class, the OF stream class, which are new data types that can do all kinds of cool fancy things. Um, they also have some other constants and functions um, associated with them. Once we've done that, well, we got to have data to write to the file, so let's make some new data. So we can have a first name, a string called blue, another string um, called last name with blue gold. Um, int age and years of blue the blue gold is say nine years. Um, weight in pounds of blue the blue gold, let's just say 152.3 uh, pounds, just made that up out, out of thin air. And then there's two new variables that are related to the file stream itself. So not data that we're gonna write to the file stream, but something about the file stream that will help us write. <clears throat> the lower one, of stream f out, is um, the out output file stream itself. I like to call it f out because it's kind of like c out, and I like to call an input file stream f in because it kind of parallels the input file stream, like or like c in. But whatever, you can call it what you want. Then there's this new thing called open mode. Um, this is a new kind of variable that specifies how you want to open up a file. Do you want to have it open for output, which is what we have here? iOS colon colon out is a constant that means open it for out output. Do we want to open it 
um, to read binary um, out or to, to write binary output? Do we want to um, open it in such a way that if the file already exists, we write to the end of the file rather than replacing the whole file? There are a bunch of these kinds of things that you can specify. Or if we read it file, do we want to read it um, you know, in input mode only? Do we want to open up in read and write mode? So there's different ways that you can open up a file. And if you want to know more about those, um, go for it. Otherwise, just you can use what's on these slides. But that's what the mode is. How do you want to open up the file? Now, since we've, pound, we've uh, done strings, we have to include the um, pound include the string library. Now, here's where we open actually do the opening up of a file. Um, notice all of these are using um, f out, so that's our output file stream f out, and then dot meaning call a function on this object. It's just like the vector object where you would do vec you know my vector dot, and then you do a function that would uh, would act or send a message to that object. So when we have this dot operator here, we're going to be saying f out, I want you to open up this file. And so the first argument of that function is the, the path of the file. Where is this file located on your file system? If you don't include a path with all of these slashes, then it will default to looking for that file in your current directory, wherever that is, which in Genie is not in a nice intuitive place. And then comma, the next argument, mode. And again, mode is how you want to open up that file. Once you've opened up the file, oh, and by the way, they're all going to how you open up the file is going to depend on what operating system you're running. So right here, um, the first one, if you're Windows, this will open up the file uh, called My File in your Documents directory. If your name, your username is user. Um, if you're on a Mac um, and you have a username of well, username, um, replace that with your own. You could write My File to your home directory. If you're on Linux, your home directory is there. You know, replace username with your username. So anyway, you only want to open up the file once. <laughs> if you try to open up twice, it'll fail the second time for sure. Um, so comment those out if it's not your system. Now, speaking of opening the file, we've supposed that this file exists or whatever. We got in and we've tried to open it using one of those three methods. We have to check now to see if it actually opened. So we can say if, and then the exclamation point, which is the not operator. So if not f out dot fail, fail is a function that returns true if something went wrong. So if it, something did not go wrong and if out, f out is open. So in other words, if something didn't go wrong and we, we are sure that f out is open, then continue on and do some reading. Otherwise, we have to check and make sure that there wasn't some kind of error. So if it's open, we can write to it. So f out, and then we use the insertion operator, first name, insertion operator, space, insertion operator, last name, insertion operator, space, insertion operator, age and years, insertion operator, space, insertion operator, weight and pounds. So we're writing out those different variables to the text file, and we're putting space in between each of the variables so that they don't all run together. Finally, when you're done with the file, you should close it. So the last slide showed us how to read or write to a file. Now let's try to read from that same file that we wrote and try to populate those variables. So this would be a different program. So here you would pound include fstream. And then all of this, of course, would be surrounded in a main method. I forgot that here. Don't worry about it for now. Um, here's what you would do. You could have these same variables that we had before. But now instead of having a value um, initializing these variables, we're going to not initialize them because we're going to read from them soon from the file. Now the last two here are the ones that are different. I open mode mode is not going to be iOS colon colon out because again we're going to be reading from the file. So now it's iOS colon colon in because we're reading the file in. And then the file is not no longer an output file stream but an input file stream. F in to be kind of like C in. So just as before we have to open up the file in the exact same way. So fn.open, the path of the file, and then the mode of the file. And okay, so it's not exactly the same. Um, it's a different mode, but the same, you know, the same kind of structure of you know, open the file with a path and then the mode. That's the same. And again, you want only one of those rather than three. Next, you read from the file using stream operators. So here we have fn, and now we're using the extraction operator. So the arrows that point to the right. And we're reading each one of those words from the stream. Now the extraction operator, as you may remember, 
actually will ignore white space. <clears throat> so if the text file had like 30 million spaces in between blue and blue gold, you know, for the first name and the last name, it'll ignore all those spaces. It'll just go straight to the words. And it'll populate those variables. Great. Next, we're if we're done, we close the file. Now, what I should have done here too is I should have checked to make sure was this file really open like I did in the last one. That's something that you guys should do as well. And you would do it in the exact same kind of way. Before you go ahead and start using IO streams, there's something you should um, to know about their state. They're going to keep track every IO stream, so an IF stream and um, OF stream, uh, a regular I stream or a regular O stream like C out or, or I stream like CN. They're going to keep track of their internal error state via these three bits, which are Boolean values. So they could have values like true, false, false, or false, 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 ideally. And this is their name. Uh, one is the EOF bit, one is the fail bit, and one is the bad bit. There's functions that are associated to check the statuses of each of these bits. So the EOF bit, you can find out if it's um, set by saying, you know, f out dot EOF, or whatever your stream variable is called, um, f in dot EOF. And that'll be true if the EOF bit is set. And that'll happen when you've reached the end of a file. So if you're trying to read from the file and you keep reading from the file, keep reading from the file, eventually you're going to get to the end. And as soon as that happens, the end of file bit gets sent. There's also the fail bit. So for instance, if you were unable to open up the file in the first place, um, that'll then that output stream or that input stream will have its fail bit set. Something happened, um, so there was a failure somewhere. So you might want to keep um, checking that. Now, the fail is actually going to return true if either the bad bit or the fail bit is set. And then the bad function is going to return true if just the bad bit is set. Usually people will check the fail bit because um, even though they don't know whether it was the bad bit or the fail bit that got set, um, there's something that went wrong, and that'll check both of those conditions. There's also a good function, and that'll return true if all bits are false. So when you open up a file, um, or after you try to open up a file, you could say, hey, if um, this you know, my stream um, dot good, you know, is it good? Is it ready for me to read from it or write to it? There's also the clear function. So say one of these things gets set in a bad way, you warn the user and then you fix something and then you want to return it to its normal state. You can do clear and that will set them all to false. So it'll be in the good state again. I just wanted to go over a few um, important notes before um, we end. So one is like on the last slide, um, every IO stream has an internal error state and you can access them via these functions and do check them from time to time. Um, it's a good idea to do that regularly. It's not very, it doesn't take much time to do it and it's a really good practice and it can save, um, save you from getting in trouble um, frequently. So good thing to check that. Also, every IO stream keeps track of its position in the file via a file reading marker. If we had been, you know, doing this class maybe 20 years ago, I would have said, this is where, you know, you are in your disc uh, or VHR or VHS player or your cassette tape player going back 30 years. Um, it's basically saying where you are in the file. And what's cool about this is that you can fast forward, rewind, or set the position of this file wherever you want. So it's a little bit less like a tape player and a little bit more like a DVD player. You can basically go wherever you want. So if you don't want to have to read all the data in, in the beginning of a big file and you want to skip to something way in the middle, you just skip right ahead to it. Um, I've never really done much of that, but you can if you want and you can figure out how to do it. The other thing is, as we mentioned, uh, or <laughs> we haven't mentioned it yet, we're about to. Um, the open function uses what's called a C style string. Now a C style string is a little bit different than a C++ string, but we can convert between them. So here's a C style string. When you have a C style string, you just have the bare quotes by itself. And so this won't produce an error. Now if you try to store that C style string into a C++ style string, a string type, that, that's fine, but then if you try to use that string type in to open up a file, that will in some C++ compilers, that will give you an error. Some C++ compilers will make a new function, you know, an open function that will you know, allow for both of those kinds of strings, so you might not get an error, but most C++ compilers will have an error there because those two strings are different. To fix that, this is actually a pretty easy fix. It's an annoying thing, but it's an easy fix, um, is you just add dot C string at the end of your file name. So if you have, if you store the string in the file as a string, um, if you store the string in the C style string in a C 
plus plus string object do that then you can convert it back to a C string um, as sh is shown there. So here are some common errors that you might encounter. The first is that I tried to open a file and I couldn't open it. You know, I tried to implement this test code just and it just wasn't working. Why is that? The most likely reason, and this is, I mean, it, it might sound like, seriously, you think that I'm spelling it wrong? This is how it is for me a lot of the time. This is how it is for a lot of other people so it's definitely worth checking, is the path um, correctly spelled? Um, so the path again is the series of directories in your file system. And again, that's gonna be a little bit different for each kind of computer that you might be working on. So Windows has a different path, way to specify the path. Mac has a different way to specify the path. Um, this is one of the bigger errors that I've encountered when it comes to working with files um, myself. The next is the spelling. So maybe you, um, the spelling of the path, you know, maybe you were trying to uh, set it to my documents instead of my documents um, with a U instead of an O. Or maybe um, you spelled your username wrong, you know, just with three S's instead of two, right? It could be a lot of things. Or it could be the actual name of the file is different. Or maybe you were saying save it to my file instead of my file.txt. Um, some operating systems will hide those file name extensions from you. What if I try to read more data than the file contains? Well, you can't read past the end of the file marker. Otherwise, you'd be reading from some other file, and you don't want that to corrupt the data that you're trying to read in. So what the computer will do is, as soon as you try to read more than what the, you know, past the end of the file, it will set that EOF bit, and the stream will enter what's called a fail state, because the EOF bit is set. As soon as any one of those bits is set, all subsequent read and write operations will be skipped. It won't tell you that it's skipped, there's no error message, it'll just be a silent error. And so it's up to you as the programmer to detect if that's the case. So bottom line, um, check early and often whether that EOF bit is set for files that you don't know the format for. If you know exactly what the file should contain, you know exactly this many bits, exactly this many bytes, nothing more, nothing less, then you probably don't have to look at that so much because you know the format. But if you don't know how long the file is and you keep on reading, maybe till the file ends, Make sure you're checking where that file ends. Other errors? So yeah, opening a file that doesn't exist. Invalid input data. So maybe you're trying to read um, an integer, but instead um, the data file, the next word that it would try to read from is the word um, elephant. And it's like, you know, I can't read an integer from the word elephant. Um, so there's, a, there's another reason you might get a fail state. You might try to open a file that is write protected. So for instance, say you're trying to um, write from uh, a very special operating system file that you know controls your operating system. It should The computer, the operating system should not let you edit that file um, accidentally or intentionally. So a lot of files will be you know, write protected. They'll be um, protected from accidents or, um, or hackers, right? Or intentional um, stuff. Here's the best practice. Again, check the fstream state after you open a file. Make sure that it's open. Make sure that it's in good you know, uh, mode. If you don't know the length of the file from, make sure you're constantly checking to see whether you've reached the end of the file. Because otherwise you're going to send data to, uh, or try to initialize a variable, and nothing's going to happen to that variable. And if you want to do that, and you want to see how to do that, um, here's a really great example of how to do it. And there's some ex extra discussion there that explains what's going on. Um, I will also be posting something called ofstreamexample.cpp on Canvas, so check that out as well. I just want to give a quick shout out to everybody who um, participated in the extra credit survey. Um, it's now closed. Um, it's been closed for a bit, but thank you to those who did it. Um, you will definitely be getting extra credit. One of the things that I got um, from your feedback was that you wanted questions that are closer in style to the kinds of questions that you would have on a quiz, rather than just you know, the questions that would maybe help you learn as much, you wanted to see kind of how might you be evaluated on, on them, which makes sense. So here are questions um, that are more in the style of quiz. Um, and I totally think I might, you know, if I'm feeling lazy or rushed for time, and who isn't, um, I would totally imagine taking some questions on the next quiz or test um, from here. Um, the next test, by the way, is the final exam. So here they are. Um, there's also more questions at uh, the link down below, and it has an answer key. And I also have included an answer key at the end of this. So make sure you go through these yourself, and then at the very end, you can go check out the answer key at the end of this lecture. All right, practice problems. I've got a couple, um, and I've got some example code to go with them, so stay tuned. 
The first practice problem is to write a function um, that will write a vector to a text file. So we've gotten through now, and I, I expect that you should know how to use vectors, how to add stuff to a vector using pushback. But now that you've done that, how would you write that to a text file? So you'd want to pass it the file name. You know, where am I going to write this uh, vector to? And then you also want to pass it the, the vector itself. Now, both of these variables will be const because if I write a vector to a file, the name of the file shouldn't change in that function, and the contents of the vector shouldn't change. I'm just reading from that file name, and I'm just reading from the vector. Now, if you do use, do that, remember that file name is going to be the path of the variable of the file that you're writing to, and you're going to have to convert that to a C string. Now, the second one here is to write a function that will read a vector from a text file. So it's going to return an object of type vector. The name could be something like read vector from file, <coughs> const string file. So again, you're passing it the name of the file you're going to read from. And then that file would have, you know, maybe uh, if it had 20 different variables, um, doubles, it would be something like, um, uh, you know, while you can still read variables, keep reading all the variables, and then when you hit the end of the file, stop reading, and then return the vector. Something like that. You asked for it, and here it is. Um, you, in your feedback on that extra credit survey, you said that you wanted me to put more time into um, uh, coding or giving you example code on the mini lectures, and then also um, you wanted to see some of the uh, solutions for the practice problems to help you um, develop as programmers. Uh, and this actually does triple duty. It does both of those two things, but then it also um, gives you an example of how exactly you should read from a file until you hit the end of the file. Um, in, in like a while loop. What is the best way to do that? Because there are many different ways that you'll see online and I've researched and figured out, okay, this is actually the best way to do it. This is like the preferred way um, with all the checks and everything. So uh, here you go. So double, and I'll be posting this on Canvas as well. So double data, um, that's gonna be a variable that you read in and then store to a vector. Um, double vector, or vector double, my vector is a vector of doubles that's initially empty. That's what you're going to return at the end of this function, which I really didn't add the function part, but you can imagine adding that. This is the meat of that function. And then an IF stream called FN. Now, the first step when you open a file is to open the file, right? So uh, FN.open and then stuff.text. So that's a nice C style string with the double quotes. But then you notice it doesn't have the mode there. Now, on, many, on most compilers, you don't actually need to have the mode, it will default to a certain value depending on what kind of stream it is. So if it's an IF stream, that value will default to um, being in. So by default, if you open an in IF stream, it will try to read from the IF stream, which makes sense. And for an output stream, it'll try to write to the um, IF stream, or OF stream. After you try to open up a file, check whether it failed. So if fin.fail, now you could also do if not fin.good. So if, it's, if you failed, or if it's not good, either way, meaning the same thing basically, then print an error like error opening the file, you could also exit the program if you want, whatever makes sense in this context. But if that's not the case, if it didn't fail or if it is good, then else, read values until we hit the EOF and file marker. This while loop is kind of wacky, it's pretty complex, um, it's not something that I would have not normally written. This is what um, <laughs> this is the complicated part that is the best practice that took a bit of researching to do. So if not, and then in parentheses, f in uh, greater than greater than ws, that's saying from the um, f in stream, extract all the white space that you can. That's the ws, that's a constant, it's a stream manipulator, which we'll learn about in the next um, episode. So extract all the white space you can, and then dot eof, that will tell you, okay, did this operation succeed? Did this one little extraction operating um, bring us to the end of the file? That will return a boolean, true if it did get you to the end of the file, and false if it didn't. We want, in it, we want to basically say, while we have not hit the end of the file, then read data from the file. So let's, let's assume that we haven't hit um, the end of the file, then we will go in and do fin less than, or greater than greater than data. So we're going to extract a double, a single double from the input stream. Then we check and see did the operation fail. If so, say there was an error reading from the file. Otherwise, if it didn't fail, then add that data to the vector. 
Then go back and try to read some more white space, like maybe a space or a tab or a new line from the file, and then see if that got you to the end of the file. If not, read more data, and, and so on and so on. Loop until you get to the end of the file. When that happens, then do fin.close. We don't want to read anything more from it because that will just be ignored because it's the end of the file. So fin.close, and then finally we can say, uh, we write in the vector and it's the size or, or whatever you want. You could write out all the values, whatever makes sense for the context of your program. Now, if you're writing the function, you don't need to put that output. You would probably just say um, uh, outside of all of these brackets and braces, outside of the if condition, the else part, then you'd probably say return my vec. It would either be empty or it would have some values in it. That's how you do it. Oh, what a mouthful. Another practice problem, because there are some really cool problems that you can have. We've just opened up a whole new world of, of all these different files. So in this one, I challenge you to write two functions, one to read and one to write, the following data from a file, each on a separate line. So string movie name, the Shawshank Redemption, without the quotes. The, it would just be one line would have the Shawshank Redemption. The next line would have Frank Darabont. By the way, this is my favorite movie. Um, another line would have the year, and then another uh, line would have the box office revenue, um, which is uh, 58.3 million. So write one that will uh, write, or write two functions. One that will write this to a file, so that function could take the string, a string, an int, and a double, as well as the name of the file um, that you're going to be reading to. And then also um, you can uh, have a similar function that would pa uh, pass by reference and uh, read those in and initialize them. Practice problem 2b, um, write a program to read the following text file and store it into the variables on the previous slide. Then print those variables out. So you can kind of reuse some of that code. So here's another movie. This would be the contents of that um, text file, say movie.txt, Back to the Future, Robert Zemeckis, 1985, and then the box office revenue. Now, notice, okay, if you do this uh, on your own and you, and you um, read uh, from a text file and you store to a string, it's only, and you fuse the uh, extraction operator, and you did it to this movie file right here, movie.txt, it's only the first string is gonna have the value back, the second string is gonna have the value two. So you're gonna have to look up a way um, to actually read the entire line, to get the entire line from this, rather than just um, reading word by word. So if you want more information about how that works, or you want any hints, let me know. Um, otherwise, that's a good challenge. Look it up online. Practice problem number three, because this really is a cool thing to practice, and I'm not going to be talking too much more about it, and I'd love for you to, to learn this better than I've had time to be able to, to teach you. So find some code that you wrote before where you asked the user for input. Make a copy of that code, and then in, in your copy, instead of asking the user for input, have the program read that same input from a text file. So that text file is going to have to have the input that you would have given to the program, but now it can read it from a text file. So that could be kind of nice in cases where maybe you want to um, uh, save yourself time from writing stuff every time. I've got a file like I do that, uh, for that for my dissertation. Um, it's, uh, instead of typing in all the settings for each run, I just um, pass it in a file um, with all the settings and then it runs it. But anyway, that's really easy to do. You could do this with a calculator code. If you don't have any uh, code that you could do this with, um, you could totally just download the calculator code key from Canvas um, uh, in the module section, and then adapt that code right there um, as we described here. So have it read from a file. As promised, um, so a, pre a few slides ago, I asked you some review questions. Here are the answers to those review questions. If you have any further questions or you're not sure about why one was what it was, uh, let me know. Send me an email and I'd love to help you out. Um, thank you guys for your time and uh, I will talk to you later.